All right, good morning. How are y'all doing? Okay, I'm glad y'all are doing good. It's good to be here this morning. If you're visiting with us, uh, we sure appreciate having you here as well. Hope you feel at home and welcome this morning and uh, looking forward to what the Lord's going to do today. Just a few announcements uh, this morning. Uh, next Saturday, it's Christmas Eve, December the 24th, we will be having a candlelight Christmas service here at 6 p.m. So if you would like to join us, good service. Last year was a great service. Uh, this year will be great service as well. Anytime we get to be in the house of the Lord is a great time. So next Saturday, 6 p.m., candlelight service here uh, at the church. Uh, you can see others. Uh, Christmas Day, uh, our services will be just one service that morning at 9 a.m. And then I believe also January the 1st, it will be 9 a.m. Is that, I, I don't know. We'll figure that out. It's coming. But we will have church here on January the 1st at one of those times. Uh, you see a medical emergencies meeting on January the 8th uh, at 3 p.m. in the fellowship hall. You can see those that are invited to attend. Uh, flowers, sign-up sheet out in the sanctuary, I mean in the foyer uh, for 2023. And any other announcements that we may have. Choir, uh, children's Christmas program is tonight. If we can get some folks to help us clear the stage right after the service this morning, it would be much appreciated. Uh, that way we can come in this afternoon and set up for children's program. I believe we're meeting at 1.30 to help decorate there. Uh, also, this Wednesday will be our youth live nativity scene. Um, uh, but we're going to set up starting tomorrow at 9 a.m. You don't have to be a youth to come help us set up. So if you want to be here tomorrow at 9 a.m. to help us set up, I would sure appreciate it. Any other announcements? All right, if not, our Sunday school today was 121. Last week was 143. And today's offering is $3,096.27. Brother Donald, would you open us in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that we can assemble together in your house today, Father, uh, to celebrate the birth of Christ, Father, the life of Christ, the love of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for our Sunday school lesson. We thank you, Lord, that um, the emphasis was on love for one another and uh, compassion and helping those, Lord, who are in need. And we just thank you so much, Lord, for the benevolence of our church and uh, the way that... Uh, we seek out those who are in need, Father. We th thank you for giving us the privilege of giving. We want to pray, Lord, you'll bless our sick people who could not be here today, Lord. We want to pray, Lord, you be with our pastor as he delivers your message today. Be with us in our song service. In your name we pray. Amen. We're next, and y'all are next, because for the first time in a long time, the choir's not going to sing a beautiful star of Bethlehem by themselves. You're going to sing it with us, and it's going to be so much fun. Ready? Let's stand up. We sing in every verse and every chord.
Brother Donald got y'all stirred up, and I gotta, as I heard somebody say to, this morning, it's kind of like herding, herding uh, fish, get everybody back. Um, so we've been looking at our Advent themes, and so we did peace, and we've done, done hope, and joy. Sorry, that got hot real quick, sorry. And now we get to do the theme of love. I get it to light. And then on our Christmas Eve service, we do the white one, and the white candle is, is called the Christ candle. Uh, and so we focus on, on Christ. I'm not saying that we're not going to focus on Christ anyway, but that's the theme of the middle candle. And I think it's appropriate, really, if you think about Christmas, you think about the theme of Christmas, you think about the themes of Christmas. The themes of Christmas really are the themes of the gospel uh, in, in general. And I want to read from um, John chapter 3, a very familiar passage that I think illustrates love very well and it also illustrates the purpose of Christmas. And John 3, starting in verse 16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works for, were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Uh, John, in this text, uses two different words that kind of illustrates the same thing. That, Jesus, that God sent his Son... And that God gave his son. He did both. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. That Jesus was sent to us to do what we couldn't do. To save us from our sins. To pay a debt that we could not pay. A price that we all rightfully owed. And he died as a sacrifice for us. He was sent with that mission. But God gave him as a gift to us. And that's the, the theme of Christmas. But it's the theme of the very heart of the gospel. 
And so love is the heart of the gospel, which we're going to look at uh, during our sermon time this morning as well. But let us just think about Christmas and it really being an opportunity to focus on the gospel, focus on who Jesus is, and focus on what Jesus has done for us. He was sent to earth to save us from our sins. The greatest price ever paid, the most perfect gift ever given, because he loves us with an infinite love that we don't deserve. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love for us, God. Thank you for loving us in such a great way that you gave your son for us, God, so that we might believe in him. God, thank you for that wonderful, wonderful gift. God, we don't deserve it. God, we're grateful for it, though, and I, I pray that we would be obedient to live in light of your love. Lord, Lord, uh, God, you, you're so good to us, God, and we're so thankful. And thank you for this season of life, season we get to focus on you, maybe in a little different way than we do the rest of the year, God. And God, we just are so thankful for who you are and what you've done for us, God. Bless our time together this morning, and it's in your name that we ask these things. Amen. The problem with Christmas is we got so many songs, we can't get them all sung. But we're going to do the best we can, and one of our favorites is The Birthday of a King, page 191. Would you turn there, please, 191? The Birthday of a King. favorite 206 is silent night holy night this will be our offertory and i'm going to ask you to stand as we sing please
seat. We've been asked to sing this again. This is 20 years we've been singing this song. Y'all need to come up with a different group. I'm 
just a simple girl from a simple world, oh angel, how can this be? How can I have a child when I'm still a child? Please tell me, how can this be? I'm still a virgin. This crazy dream last night An angel spoke to me Said it's alright Sweet Mary carries God's own son And you shall call his name Jesus Don't be afraid Take Just spoke to me last night. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. I'm just a simple girl from a simple world. How can you say it's so? with us. That's the name of Emmanuel. That's what it means. God is with us. One of those things we should know year-round, but we definitely look at around Christmas. So this morning I'd ask if you turn to the book of 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 as we continue this, this theme of love, which is typically the fourth Sunday of Advent. So the first three topics, we, again, we've looked at. We've looked at hope, and how Christmas reminds us that we have a hope, and the hope that we have is in Christ Jesus himself, that if we put our hope in anything else other than Christ, uh, we will be lacking. We have 
plenty of false hopes in this world, but Christ is our true hope. We looked at peace and how we need to have peace in our life. And again, peace is found in the person and work of Jesus, that you can't have lasting peace of any sort apart from Christ's work in your life life, that your life can be falling apart around you, and you can have peace in Jesus. And then we looked at joy, that the joy is one of those things, it's a byproduct, it's a natural byproduct of knowing who Jesus is, of trusting in his work, and trusting in his goodness and his grace, and his plan for your life, that you need to have joy, but we can't have joy apart from Jesus. And now we get again to the The fourth Sunday in Advent, the traditional topic just of love. And so I want to ask you as we just start thinking about this this morning, is what is it that you love about Christmas? What is it that you love about Christmas? I love the traditions around Christmas. And I actually love to learn about certain people's and certain families' traditions because every family tradition of Christmas is a little different, right? Right? Uh, something that, that we've done ever since I was a little kid when, when I, my dad was my pastor. And I, again, invite you guys all to, to be here this Saturday as we do our, our candlelight service. It's something I've done every Christmas Eve as long as I can remember. I love Christmas music after Thanksgiving, right? That's the only appropriate time that you should be listening to Christmas music is after Thanksgiving. I love the Christmas lights. I don't know if you like Christmas lights, but if you don't, you're a Grinch. Christmas lights are fantastic. I love Christmas lights. Uh, I love certain Christmas movies. I love Christmas Vacation. I could watch that every month of the year, personally. Um, I I love White Christmas, the old school black and white one. I love that. Uh, I love Home Alone, Elf, uh, and everybody's favorite, uh, Die Hard, which is a Christmas movie. All right? I love Christmas food. And there's certain things about Christmas food that I wonder why we only eat these certain things at Christmas. Like, why in the world do we only eat Oreo balls at Christmas? Those things are fantastic. You should eat those year-round. They're awesome, right? Um, but we love Christmas traditions, and I know, I know we all love different things about Christmas. But at Christmas, we ought to stop to consider the, the concept and theme of love because it's front and center in the entire Christmas story. The concept of love is front and center in the Christmas story. Love is the theme of Christmas, but it really is the theme of the very gospel. Love is the theme of the gospel, and because it's a the theme of our gospel, it is also the theme of our lives. Amen, right? There you go. It's all good. Just remember, Jesus came just like that. If you don't think Jesus cried, you probably missed it, right? But love is the theme of Christmas, but it's the theme of the gospel. But it also must be the theme of our lives if we claim to know Christ himself. Because love is from God himself. So with that being said, I want us to look again at 1 John chapter 4. We're going to read verses 7 through 11 as we consider this theme of love at Christmas. And it starts in verse 7. John writes, again, John wrote John 3. We just read this morning. He's picking this up. You know, decades later, he's picking the same theme back up because it's a theme that dominated John's life. And he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest or made known among us that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for loving us. God, for sending your son to us out of your love as a supreme demonstration for your love for us, but also making sure that in your loving plan that Jesus himself was willing to die for us to save us from our sins. God, thank you for your great love. God, may we be people defined by that same love, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. So John starts off this section in in chapter 4 
by referring to the church as beloved. It's a favorite term of John's, and it's, and it's an important thing to even consider as we start off on this text because it's a reminder that we, as believers, are loved. That the supreme creator of everything, the one that spoke things into existence, loves us. But more than him just loving us, it's also, uh, it also reminds us that the love that God had for us was put into action towards us. It connects this fact that, God, that we are loved to also to the fact that we are supposed to love because God himself is love, and it's a sign that we know the loving God who loves us. So to love one another here, as John says in, chapter, in verse 7, it's a sign of this unity that only comes from the salvation that we possess. We are not naturally loving people. In our very nature, we're selfish people. If you don't believe people are born selfish, just have children. You don't have to teach a kid to be selfish, do you? It's inherent to who we are. We're born sinful people. We, we were born in sin. We choose to sin. We are sinful people. So this concept of love comes to us from the Lord himself who gives us this love. This is one of the major points of Christmas. Jesus came to earth because he loved us in order to save us. Verse 7, John tells us that if we know this loving God that we worship at Christmas— we will also be loving Christians who love others as a sign that we understand that love that has been shown to us. Look at it again. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Do you want to know if you understand the point of Christmas this Christmas? Answer this question. Are you a loving person? Because that's a sign that we understand Christmas. Understanding the love of God means that we must love others. This is how we know God, John says. John Stott, a great preacher, said it this way. For God who is love and has still loved loves, and today his love is seen in and through our love. That God's love is seen in our love that we show to others. This is what John is talking about. Now, Please understand this, that it is not our love that saves us. I want you to hear that again. Our love does not save us. Also, us loving people, that also does not save us. It is God's love for us that saves us. In other words, it is not the person's ability to love that causes us to be saved, but his ability to love flows from our salvation. Our own ability to love people comes because it comes from Lord, the Lord. Just as we're born sinful, we don't really have this ability to truly, truly love in a selfless way. When God saves us, he gives us love, but he also gives us the ability to love others. So loving Christ means that we love others. But also let us look at this negative part of this command in verse 8. John says, anyone who does not love does not know God. This is important. Loving others is a sign that we love God, but not loving others is a sign that we don't know God. Both of these are true. If we love God, we love others. If we don't love God, or we don't love others, we don't love God. They are equal opposites. They're flip sides of the same coin, right? Loving others is a sign that we love God, but not loving others is a sign that we don't. For just as we often say, God is what? Love, it says. The point here is that this absence of love is an evidence that we don't understand the gospel. God is love. And since God is love and he's loving towards us, he gives us his love. Therefore, we ought to take the love that he's given us and show it to others. It's a natural byproduct. Look at verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. This, again, is the entire point of Christmas. The love of God was made manifest. It was made known. How? Jesus was sent. So the baby we, we talk about at Christmas in the manger and, and the baby that was born into a poor, 
and seemingly insignificant family was the made manifest, the made knownness, if you will, of, of God's love towards us. That's the point of Christmas. The entire point of Christmas is Jesus was sent to us because God loves us. And he knows what we really need in our life. So what's this point of Christmas? It's, it's love. It's not just love, it's love made known. It's love made visible. It's love made accessible. It's love given. It is love that has been sent. It is love that is shown. Love is the very heart of the entire Christmas story. And thus, it's the, it should be at the very heart of every believer that has encountered the saving love of God himself. Friends, do you know that God loves you this Christmas. You are beloved. Not because we've earned it or because we've, you know, done good things or because we've, you know, got check marks beside our name for doing good deeds or none of those things. We are loved because God himself is loving. And he has demonstrated his great love to us by sending his son on a mission to save us. That's the nature, and that's the purpose of Christmas. But there's more to this Christmas story than just love. God had only one son and sent him into the world because of his great love for the world, the Bible says. But the purpose of sending his son, according to this text, was so that we might live through him. Now, folks, the world doesn't have a problem with baby Jesus. They don't. They don't have a problem with celebrating Jesus at Christmas. The, the world doesn't have a problem with saying God is love. But the world has a problem with living their lives through Christ. But if we're honest, sometimes we as believers have the same problem. That we're not as obedient to God's word as we should. And we don't do the things that God would have us to do like we ought. But God's word tells us that we are to live our lives through him as a demonstration of the love that he has for us. Verse 10 says, In this is love, that he loved us and sent his son. Again, I picked up on this already when we lit the candle. But not only was Jesus born, he was sent. He was sent. He had a purpose. He had a mission. He was sent on a loving mission. But that loving mission was actually to deal with our wicked sin. Our, our mission on earth is basically to sin. But Jesus' mission to earth was to save and to seek that which was lost, which is us. Christmas is about how a loving God sent his only son to us. And so Christmas is not just about giving, and it's not just about getting. It is about sending. And folks, we have been sent the greatest news the world has ever heard. Folks, as we see in this verse, love is always demonstrated by actions. Let me repeat that. Love is always demonstrated in actions. If the Bible just told us that God loved us, but God did nothing for us, it would be an unloving thing to say. But the Bible does not tell us. The Bible actually tells us that God loved us, and as a result, he sent us someone, and his name was Christ. God sent Jesus to us, but God is also, I think, something we need to be reminded about at Christmas is this. God is also choosing to send us to the world. That we take the loving news of the gospel message that we've been given through the work of Christ, and we take that same gospel message to others. Why? Because God is love. And if we have that same love that God has given us, we must take that love to the world. It's one reason we celebrate Lottie Moon at Christmas time. We, we understand that it is a loving thing to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so we ask for money for Lottie Moon just to, so we can put more missionaries at the ends of the earth. Why? Because we know God has sent us also with the message that he sent his son to bring us. But also, notice what Jesus was sent as. John says this in 1 John. He was sent as a propitiation for our sins. Now look, that's a big word, propitiation, all right? But it's an important term. And it basically means this. 
Our sin has caused an irreparable separation between God and us. And there's nothing we could ever hope to do to remove that separation. We are sin sinners by nature. We are sinners by choice. And we owe God, who is holy and cannot look at sin, a debt that we cannot ever hope to pay. And so Jesus is the propitiation for that sin, meaning this, that Jesus dies on the cross to take the death that we rightfully owed for being sinners, and he gives us his righteousness and his holiness because he himself was sinless. And so in this great exchange, God takes, he sends the sacrifice to die for us on the cross to pay a debt that we rightfully owed to give us his righteousness. And so when Jesus dies on the cross, he absorbs the very wrath of God that is real. And you need to understand, it is Christmas, and I understand we're talking about love, but I want you to understand this out of love. If that you have never placed your trust in Christ, the wrath of God himself is burning against you. But Jesus was sent, because he loves you, to take that price. And to take that debt that you rightfully owe to give you what you don't deserve, which is grace, mercy, and salvation. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas ultimately is God loves you, repent and be saved. And so Jesus does this because he loves us. And then look at verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, how did he so love us? He loved us to death, literally. If God so loved us like that, John is saying, we also ought to love one another. If God so loved us, does God love us? Yes. Amen. He's just told us. He's demonstrated how much he loves us by being the propitiation for our sin. So if God loves us deeply, and he does, this word here, ought to love one another, it means that we ought or we are obligated to love. That's really what it means. It really means this. If beloved, if God so loved us, we are obligated to love one another. That's what it translates. Once we begin to understand the great price that Jesus himself has paid for us because he loves us, our life now must be marked by a radical love that doesn't make sense. Jesus' use of ought, it means that there's this inner motivation that must define who we are and what we do. By loving others, we ought, we ought to do this. We are obligated to do this because Jesus himself loves us. And what it also means, this obligation to love cannot be postponed for any reason. We might think we have reasons not to, but we don't. Jesus' love was made known through action, so must ours also be. So if God loves us, and folks, he does, because we are beloved through Christ, we are obligated to love others. Loving others here is not a suggestion for, for John. It's the heart of the Christmas story. It's the heart of the very gospel. I'm so glad that the gospel was not defined by justice. Because what would be just, what would be right, if you think about it, would be for God to send every one of us to hell for our sin. Instead, we're defined by love. God looks at us through the lens of love, Love that sent him on the cross to die in our place. This Christmas, let us remember that we get an opportunity to encounter this great love of God, but let us also understand that this love of God demands that we love others. So what do we see from, from this? I just want to give you a few quick points. First is this. We need to be reminded this Christmas that we are saved by love. Not our love not our loving others, but we're saved by the love of Christ. And that's good news for us, folks. It means we don't work for it. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to do anything to keep it. We don't have to make sure our lives are perfect. It means we don't have to keep up appearances. It means we can be honest and truthful about where we are in life. It means that we are saved in and only through the love of Jesus. There's no precondition we have to meet. There's no list we have to check off. There's nothing we have to do. We just got to trust in his love. He came to us in love, but that love was seen 
and the cross. This is love, friends. Now, sure, giving gifts and spending time with family, all those things can be great and entertaining and fun and needed even. But make no mistake, true love was demonstrated on a cross. This is love, and this is the point of Christmas. Second, we need to be reminded that a Christian that understands love is indwelled with love. Meaning this, a genuine saved Christian will be known by love because God himself has given that to us. Loving others is a byproduct of knowing Christ. And we can't do it apart from Jesus. This is, this is the fact. God shares his love to us, but he also puts that love inside us. See what I'm saying? Like God gives us the love that he wants us to show because he knows we can't do it apart from him. We get salvation and forgiveness, yes, but God also tells us through his word that he gives us a new heart. That's the point of Christmas. And third, we need to be reminded that Chris, this Christmas that a Christian is also called to love others. If a Christian is indwelled with this love of Christ, he's given a new heart, and the Bible tells us clearly that that happens, we all need to know and be reminded that loving others shows that we're saved. That's God's word plainly to us. And none of us are exceptions. So, a, a unloving heart is an unsaved heart. So we're called to love those around us because God's love saves our hearts and changes them. Folks, aren't you glad that God has changed you? Because if, if you're not really glad that God's changed you, then you either don't think you needed saving or changing, which means you think you're perfectly fine where you are, and that's not a good thought. To, that's not a good place to be, folks. Every one of us needs the, God, the grace of God in our life. But a Christian's love Love for Christ and love for others should be a magnet for the gospel. So when the world looks at us, do they see this love that can only be described by the supernatural work of Christ in our life? That's the point of Christmas. We are saved by love. Not our love, Jesus' love. I'm so glad that Jesus is the one that decided to save us, folks, because none of us could save ourselves. We are indwelled with love. We are given the love that we need because it must come from somewhere else because it doesn't exist inside us. God gives us the love that we need to love people the way he's told us to. Because if God doesn't give us the, the means to do what he's called us to do, we never could do it anyway. So he indwells us with this love. And then lastly, the Bible tells us we're called to take that indwelling love and to share it with others. Folks, that's the point of Christmas. That's the message of Christmas, yes. But I submit to you that that's actually the message of the entire gospel. That God loves us, God saves us, and God wants us to make a difference in the world. Aren't you glad that Jesus was sent and he was given to change the world? And we're all beneficiaries of that this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love for us, God. God, you're so good to us. God, you're better to us than we deserve. You do more things for us than we should, or than you should. But, God, we're just so thankful that you do it anyway. God, we love you, and we thank you for the great love that you have shown us. And it's in your beautiful and precious name we pray. Amen. If you'd stand as we sing. Page 198. 198. 198.